So, but as soon as he gets in there, we start talking about it. And that was pretty uh, significant at the end. I can't wait to see what else will make us do something, and we can actually do it. And the other thing I noted uh, to these ladies was two weeks ago, I was at a transit conference here in town, like your typical transit conference, professionals there, and the um, head of our transportation planning in the city, Dale Bracewell, was there speaking, doing the, sh the typical show of what's coming up in Vancouver for transportation, and one of his slides had uh, something, a piece on there about gender mainstreaming. And he didn't speak to it. I don't think anybody else noticed this. But this is this, this is kind of the opposite of the gents. Is you start getting the message out there, and eventually it becomes uh, kind of normal, and then so many things begin to happen. So that I don't. So thank you. So um, I'm just going to take a little pause here to make sure that that everybody is getting what this framework is all about and why we did it, and make sure that if you have any questions about it, we answer them now before we go to the next two speakers. So if anybody here have questions or comments on this uh, introduction to what we're building? And what exactly is gender mainstream? Ah, gender mainstream. Yeah, it's the expert It's um, gender mainstream it's a, it's, a, it's more of a process that uh, looks at all of the policies, programs, and project delivery and incorporates a gender perspective into it. And intersectionality goes a step further and, and looks beyond the, uh, the dimension of diversity of gender. It looks at race, it looks at disability, it looks at indigenous and other dimensions and if, of diversity. If, if you so. go to the Women Transforming Cities website, there's resource materials. You go to the Status of Women Canada website. Some very good resource materials. There's even some good resource materials on the, uh, the uh, Canadian uh, Engineering Society's website. Mm -hmm. So it's it started off with gender, now it's gender based plus, but incorporates the intersectionality. And intersectionality came from Professor, from, uh, professor Crenshaw, a black scholar, who talked about the white women's movement in the United States not allowing black women to be part of the movement and how. Weaken the movement, and then more recently, the last couple of years, she said that intersectionality must be rooted in social justice. It can't be just like two gay men white like Mohawk selling fans of these dogs. It's got to really have that 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 understanding that if you you're say dealing with a transportation system, you have to deal with say 80 percent of users at night are women. Many of them are immigrant women. So how are you going to decide? Any other questions or comments about this section? Okay, Jackie. Would you like to introduce yourself and present yourself? Sure. So I wanted to thank uh, the City of Vancouver and also Women Transforming Cities for this uh, wonderful opportunity and this event. Um, I'm going to speak today about wise practices from post disaster Japan and particularly looking at the tremendous impact that young women's leadership has had for the post disaster context of reconstructing uh, remote and fairly rural communities in a fairly conservative part of Japan called the Tohoku region. So um, I'm a political scientist uh, here from Delta BC, but I've been in Japan for the greater part of 17 years um, and have working on basically citizenship as we understand it in Canada in terms of inclusive citizenship, diverse citizenship, and then how we think through our public policy mechanisms to be inclusive in terms of mainstreaming gender, uh, diverse communities, uh, LGBTQ people with disabilities, indigenous people. So I've been bringing this lens from Canadian intersectionality um, to think through what, what might Japanese citizenship look like in the future. Japan is at a critical crossroads of struggling with an aging society, declining birth rates, um, trying to figure out whether to adopt immigration, um, how to deal with these issues. Um, within the post-disaster context, that really has played out in interesting and troubling ways because all of this sort of systemic discrimination has been exacerbated by the disaster, and what was unequal pre-disaster becomes exceptionally unequal in a post-disaster context, uh, and this means a tremendous decrease in well-being, in safety, and of course of the resilience of the communities themselves. So I'm going to speak um, about sort of bringing together what I've been working on, uh, feminist philosophies of disaster risk governance and disaster 
resilience, which is also dialoguing with diverse citizenship and intersectionality in public policy. So we're trying to think through how we understand risk, how we democratize risk, if you will, and think through that risk is going to affect all of us at different points in our lives. And we're trying to build in some ways, we have hard infrastructure, and we think through how we build our hard infrastructure. Well, our laws and our policies are our soft infrastructure. That is exactly what is bringing together our sense of togetherness. It's regulating how we react, how we share through socioeconomic sharing, um, how we create lifelines um, and safety nets so that we can deal with risk when we are confronted as communities, as families, as regions, and as economies. Um, so when we're thinking through risk from a sort of intersectional analysis, what does that mean in terms of how we think through decision making and democratic decision making about risk, about disaster management? Um, so part of this is looking at challenging what up until now is often a, a fairly technocratic conversation of bureaucrats with disaster management expertise, training. In Japan, it's particularly a top-down um, command and control style of process that doesn't necessarily involve stakeholders and community members that need to be part of the conversation and understand their own risk probably better in many ways. So how do we build a, a, a sort of inclusive deliberation and process that engages um, communities in this conversation about how we share risk? And then how we um, try to think through equality, how, how do we mitigate systemic discriminations that already exist so that they do not become exacerbated. So I've done some case studies on diverse young women, and this is a project, and I'll, I think I have it later here. Um, it was funded by not only the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, for which I'm very grateful, um, it's a participatory action research, which is um, sort of a unique methodology, it's very grassroots. Um, and my goal was to look at what, what does it mean for Tohoku in the magnitude 9 earthquake, followed by a tremendous tsunami, and then following with a nuclear meltdown. How does this sort of cascading effect of three major disasters affect a region? And then how do we think through uh, the response and the policy response? Um, I wanted to understand from the grassroots perspective of young women and what they were trying to bring in terms of their agency to reconstruct their cities and their communities. So there was a series of um, grassroots academies uh, for women's leadership that was spearheaded by a very innovative uh, non-governmental organization, non-profit organization called Women's Eyes. You can see the, the logo. And through really this relationship with Women's Eyes, uh, they invited me to come and participate in their, in their grassroots academy leadership training for young women in the region. So I went, not simply as an observer, as a, you know, putting on a scientific uh, coat and pretending to be objective, I was a full participant. I engaged with all of the young women who were like and what they were citizenship and inclusion might look for for building sort of women friendly cities. So women friendliness being really sort of a, a key signal that allows us to be building inclusive cities. In Japan, women are disproportionately shouldering largely alone the caregiving roles. There is strong traditional gender roles still, and particularly in the region of Tohoku where it's more conservative. So if you think through what it means to exclude women from city planning, it means that in many ways in the post-disaster context, we saw major oversights on understanding caregiving needs. So what does it mean to have an evacuation center that fails to understand what infants require, what toddlers require, what elementary school children require to be experiencing wellness in a disaster in, a, in an evacuation center? What does it mean for people with disabilities and their caregivers Dominant women. What does it mean for the elderly? Japan has a significant elderly population. It's, it's at the head of the curve for this trend worldwide. Um, so women trying to deal with caregiving their elder parents in an evacuation center where there's zero privacy, uh, where there's limited mobility access for these elderly populations trying to get to the washroom. There's issues of pride, there's issues of dignity, and the women who are the primary caregivers not only having to deal with sheltering their the people they're caregiving for from the sort of embarrassments that they're feeling, but also the additional sort of stress and emotional uh, pressures that they are feeling themselves as going through this. So building a women-friendly city, absolutely, in the post-disaster context of Japan, had there been better implementation on the policy side of the priorities that the women's equality sections of city halls identified in a 2008 survey, but the disaster management side failed to identify in a 2008 
made survey to be meaningful and important. Um, had that been taken into consideration in policy making for evacuation centers, the 2011 post-disaster context for all of those populations would have been much less dramatic. So this pilot program, um, I also have developed case studies around um, about 20 women in the Tohoku region who are in vastly different fields. Um, and since doing the research, I'm also mentoring them through this pilot program to help them convert their lessons learned and their wise practices to disseminate through global uh, sharing. And, and I'm very grateful for Women Transforming Cities for the invitation to do this. So it's, it's pushed us to share the research beyond just Japan. So I'm going to speak about the two women uh, that are in the picture on the left-hand side here. Um, so the research itself was also presented in a, in a photo exhibit that was traveled to Los Angeles and shared in the Los Angeles community. It's been shared across Japan. Um, and I'll focus in on two stories and attempts to convey some of the lessons learned for these two women in their stint as they're not able to be here today. So Miyoko Sato is in Hanamaki in Iwate Prefecture. And maybe I'll go back to here. So Iwate Prefecture is the very top. Um, right hand most uh, prefecture. It's exceptionally remote. Uh, it was very hard hit by the tsunami, and it has one of the lowest economic uh, uh, statuses within Japan as a prefecture. So working environments are very difficult, very traditional attitudes around gender, it's hard for women to have acceptance of basic uh, rights to self-determination and making decisions for themselves, um, and much is very much dictated still within the, the sort of multi-generational household structure, whereby oftentimes you're living with the uh, the grandparents, and within the Japanese structure of, of if you think about uh, citizenship, citizen engagement, when city halls in these regions engage citizens, they send an invitation to come to a information session with city hall, and one invitation goes out to the house, and it goes out to the head of the household. So grandfather will be invited, grandmother will not, son will not be invited, sons wife or the daughter-in-law will not be invited. So you're, you're also just getting a limited amount of information about what the needs of those households are by virtue of the way that democracy is practiced on a household level rather than an individual level. So Mia Posato is a midwife. She had a child of her own already, one small child, baby, and yet in the post-disaster context, being a midwife, she realized that she had to do something to participate and to help provide relief. So in the post-disaster context, um, the disaster was in March 2011. By the fall, she had created this organization called Mama Rumana, Mama Iwate, and it is basically providing postnatal and maternal care. Um, this had tremendous challenges, you can imagine, uh, venturing out with a baby strapped on your back to go to remote communities, sometimes driving four hours to reach the coastal area so that she could provide postnatal and maternal care. So she teamed up with two other women who uh, were also experiencing difficulties in trying to work through and support uh, other women in the region and the coastal areas. In some ways, what's interesting is the remoteness of the coastal communities hit by the tsunami already were underserved in terms of maternal care. They didn't have, they had sort of one hospital that you would have to drive about an hour to get maternal care. So for women who are concerned about their pregnancies, who are concerned about their infants to be able to reach and get access to that, you still already were facing this one hour drive. And then post disaster, of course, limited capacity to even access any supports. And yet, babies are still born, they arrive when they arrive. Post maternal care is still necessary, postnatal care is still necessary. Um, what was an interesting, and so this was going on basically from 2011 fall through to the present. She has since, she was servicing these communities. Um, with her colleagues who were also very uh, concerned. Um, but in the process of servicing these communities, and often it meant offering um, a salon, as they would call it, sort of a, a mother's meetup salon of maternal uh, and postnatal care, <coughs> encouraging women to come to talk about what they, their, their actual needs were, what they were challenged with. And through the process of going back and building trust, Eventually, they would begin to speak about a whole gamut of other challenges that they were actually facing as women that were hidden, that they couldn't speak about publicly, that they couldn't really confine in anybody, and they didn't really know where to go. 
So a lot of other issues uh, came to the fold. Um, and basically over the last uh, eight years now, um, this has led to recognition of the importance of maternal care and postnatal care to create a space for women to just have per permission to go out. Because in some ways, why are you leaving? Why are you going out? Why do you need to go to this mama salon? Why do you need to go to this? Why do you need to go see these people? Well, if you have a maternal health care, if you have a postnatal concern, then it's legitimate to go out and seek sort of these spaces with other women who are health experts health experts alone. For that is the perception and that creates a safe space for them to come forward and then also engage other challenging issues that they're in fact dealing with. Um, so this has gone for eight years. She was, um, Mama Maru, Mama Iwate was subsequently uh, funded by the local government to continue this important work. It's meant that uh, uh, Miyoko has been able to channel this critical information about women's needs across Iwate. Uh, back to local governments to help evolve their thinking on these issues, to help them think through what kinds of services and real needs are there from day to day, not alone, notwithstanding uh, the disaster context, and to sort of mainstream and integrate these core voices. And this is a region that is suffering child with declining fer uh, fertility rates, declining birth rates. So all communities are struggling to compete for population to have more births, to encourage more women to have children, and yet they're not seeing the gaps in the actual services for those very individuals um, that might help them want to stay in their regions and their communities, but if there's no support and there's, there's no um, postnatal care or maternal care, they end up moving towards the urban centers, and this leads to depopulation. So it is in some ways allowing bureaucrats to take stock of how to be a competitive city is also to be women friendly because you cannot retain this key demographic of child-rearing families if the women are not able to find supports, not only for postnatal and maternal care, but also for reemployment and for other facets. So um, she's had a tremendous impact, and I have statistics that I can give if, if people are wanting more information on how many, um, but basically participants of around 5,000 people over the last eight years, 5,000 women have come to have these salons and these uh, maternal care salons salons that they come and can buy and have access. She also has this care house uh, actually in Hanamaki that is also servicing the Hanamaki area. So that's case number one. Um, case number two is Megumi Ita Itabayashi and um, she has a very interesting organization called Mama Power Spots in Yukuzen Takata. So in Japan a power spot is sort of a, a natural spot. It can be a natural spot in the forest, it can be a hot spring, it can be a place where there's sort of an understanding Understanding a mystical sense of rejuvenation that you gain from visiting it. Um, and so her goal is to say we want to make Ikuzen Takata a space that rejuvenates and empowers and is promoting well-being for mothers in particular. So partly it's about again helping local municipal authorities and officials who are predominantly male understand that to be a community that can retain child-rearing families, and particularly women who will be having children, there needs to be this sense of wellness in the community. And it has to be women-friendly. So the Mama Festivals in Yukuzen Takara, and I'll maybe ask you to read of that. <clears throat> um, they've been held uh, basically uh, four times in, in the past years. And it was uh, created by uh, Megumi and two other uh, friends, colleagues, who decided that in post-disaster Tohoku, and many of the reconstruction plans were sort of brought from the national government with not a lot of stakeholder engagement. And when you get stakeholder engagement, you get sort of invitations to the head of the household. So not a lot of women, and certainly not young women with children, being engaged in these processes to help think through what is the future of the community going to look like. We're starting from scratch. Because Takata was wiped in many large, in many uh, areas, completely flat by the tsunami. So you're completely rebuilding. Hard infrastructure, soft infrastructure, everything. Um, so in a space of having nothing, how do you then rebuild? And where are you investing the national budget for reconstruction? Um, and she was noticing that significant investments were being made 
in facilities that she was feeling were not actually about the future of the community and they were not actually about supporting the childbearing families and certainly not the mothers who were trying to find public spaces that were welcoming of mothers and women, but also mothers who have young children, that women want to be able to go out, they want to have parks for their children, they need to have spaces to convene, and those basic fundamental parts of sort of well-being in the collective infrastructure was not adequately being sort of mainstreamed. So the Mama Festivals were about bringing women together, giving them a space to convene, and this is a small city, um, a small isolated city of about uh, 19,000 people. 40% um, of that uh, are aged 65 and over. Um, and within this city, we're talking about maybe 100 births. And so again, this logic of trying to encourage women to want to live there and to have children and to, to retain, to stay there and build the community and to find a sense of wellness as they're child rearing and also trying to pursue work. Um, if you're looking at traditional gender roles, there was a, a need for, in some ways, reaching out to those women who were feeling isolated, who were feeling like they didn't have anywhere to go and convene. They're stuck in their homes with their children. It's highly stressful, and in many cases, if they're not in their homes because they're in prefabricated housing, and Megumi herself was in prefabricated housing, not for one year, not for two years, but all the way up until 2018 with her children. Um, so men go back to work some of the time, women go back to work if they do, if they have the luxury of being re-employed, but the women who are not able to seek re-employment due to a variety of, of issues, know where to have childcare for your children, um, and then finding work means that you're in a home, at the home and you have your children and it's difficult to just even find space to convene with other women. So the Mama Festivals were a space for women to come together, for women to start realizing that they have skills, they have skills that society needs, that they're not just mothers, and women themselves, mothers were, themselves, were feeling that they were limited by their own understanding of, well, now I'm a mother, I can't work. Now I'm a mother, I can't do X, Y, or Z. So coming together and then seeing how other women were pursuing balance that included their mothering roles, but also other responsibilities, and then finding permission to be an individual who also has talents from past professional pursuits, and that that is not in competition with their mothering. That it's not, they're not sacrificing their children by having other interests or by wanting to use their skills and their career and professional interests um, in ways that bring them back out into the public sphere. How we doing? Okay. Um, so the Mama Festivals um, have sort of generated, and I have the statistics I'm gonna share maybe later so that we can uh, wrap up in the interest of time, but I would just sort of say that one of the largest things that I personally, having lived in Sendai at the time of the earthquake, I had a seven month old. Um, communities are your first lifeline. My neighbors were my lifelines. So we need to have a sense of rethinking resilience about building community, building inclusive communities, and then also having soft infrastructure, public policies and laws that support us in having these lifelines such that the core needs of the full range of diverse populations, diverse households, is absolutely manufactured from the start in the way that we think about disaster risk and how we share risk as a community. And I hope that people afterwards will ask her about an amazing group of others that she introduced us to in Fukushima and how they organized after the them to notify people about nuclear hotspots in their community. Are there any specific questions people have right now before we go on to our panel? Do people need to stand up and sit down? There's this terrible silence. <laughs> so can you just kind of move people to the like this? Yes. 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 So feel free to move around and stand up uh, while I talk. I won't so I take that personally. I understand that we all have different learning styles and different ways of, of receiving information and sitting down might not be your, your jam for this long. So feel free to stand up and walk around while I'm speaking. It's all good. Um, my name is uh, Therese Boulard. I'm a, a settler in these traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slavitudes. And uh, I go by the pronoun 
Ann Sheher, and I'm a consultant in the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion for the City of Vancouver. Um, and I'm really happy to be here today and, and honored to be sharing uh, a, a panel with such amazing women. So thanks so much to uh, Ellen and Joy for, for having us here. I want to share three wise practices um, that the City of Vancouver has on the Women, on the Women Friendly Cities Challenge website. Um, and uh, they all support the city's goal to be um, a city where all self-identified women can fully benefit from uh, inclusion in the uh, social, cultural, political, and economic life of the city. And that's the stated goal of the Women's Equity Strategy. It's the goal of the city um, overall. So those, these three uh, wise practices that I'm going to share support that goal. So the first one is, um, and, and this really speaks to what Jackie was talking about in terms of uh, democratizing and, and being open, the city has a women's advisory committee that is one of um, many uh, community advisory committees. And these uh, community advisory committees are mandated by council. Um, they are made up of volunteers from the community who come to meetings at least every quarter, and they represent a diversity of backgrounds, experiences, and expertise, including work <coughs> experience. They're supported logistically by the city's office of the clerk with meeting space, agenda, and, and note taking. Uh, it's an open public recruitment process. Um, the community advisory committees not only have the women's advisory committee, but the LGBTQ2+, the urban indigenous peoples, racial and ethnocultural equity, persons with disability, there's seniors and youth, there's a number of community advisory committees. And this council has updated its policy on these committees so that all of the committees must have 50% self-identified women on its membership, except for the Women's Advisory Committee, which must be 100% which must be self-identified women. The LGBTQ2 plus Advisory Committee has to have an equal number of self-identified uh, women and men, as well as at least one member that identifies outside of the gender binary. So um, that is that change in policy is actually uh, because of the last Women's Advisory Committee and the input that they provided into the women's equity strategy influencing other policies. So I'm going to talk a bit about how the council adopting the Women's Advisory Committee has had these this offshoot of effects, including um, updating our procurement policy, which wasn't part of our phase one actions, but it's, it's really influencing across the city other things that are happening in a positive way. So the Women's Advisory Committee, as I mentioned, is made up of 100% self-identified women. Uh, they have a specific mandate to advise council and staff on enhancing access and inclusion for women and girls to fully participate in city services and civic life, and to advise council and staff on the women's equity strategy as it is developed, implemented, and updated. And I can speak to the amazing work that the last uh, Women's Advisory Committee put into the development of the strategy. They spent so many hours and had subcommittees and meetings with us, and they really informed uh, the women's equity strategy uh, and, and will continue to. There's been a new uh, committee that's just been formed, a whole new uh, membership for all of the advisory committees. So we're looking forward to working with these new committees that are just starting up in June now, they're having their first meetings in the next couple of months. Um, the second wise practice that is on the Women Friendly Cities Challenge that uh, the city uh, has been working on since 2016 is a transgender variant and two-spirit inclusion strategy. Um, Council adopted this strategy in 2016, building on the work that uh, the Vancouver Board of Parks and Recreation had already started in 2014. And um, yeah, so there's a lot of work that's gone into that. Uh, in 2016, when Council adopted the policy, there were five what, what the policy refers to, or the, sorry, the strategy refers to as pillars, um, public spaces, facilities and signage, programs and services, human resources, communications and data, and community consultation and public partnerships. So across those five pillars, there were over 30 recommended actions. And since 2016, city staff have been slowly rolling out uh, implementation of those actions. So picking a few actions a year to work on. We can't do all 30 all at once or 35 all at once. Um, so some of the key accomplishments um, of this. And by the way, uh, both Cheryl and Ellen mentioned earlier that last week on May 29th, we had uh, provided an update to council 
on this strategy as well as the women's equity strategy. So if you want a full update with details on what's been happening in all of these areas, go to vancouver.ca forward slash women's equity and just scroll down and look for the link to the May 29th update to council. It's right there and you can read it, read all about it. And I think uh, there might also be a link to that update on the yeah, Women Friendly Cities Challenge. So um, it's uh, very transparent. Uh, and that transparency uh, is all about accountability as well. When we make these commitments, we want to make sure that we report back and, and talk about what we're doing. So some key accomplishments um, in the last couple of years, inclusive washroom signage has been installed in all city-owned and leased facilities. Um, and in uh, we, th there wasn't the, um, the, uh, the kind of financial ability to retrofit uh, our existing facilities for to create fully gender neutral washrooms. Uh, it is uh, going forward to new developments that that gender neutral washroom um, design is, is is included. But for what we could do for now is is create inclusive washroom signage. Um, we've uh, uh, there's a permanent full time position or a permanent position now with the Board of Parks and Recreation that's a transgender variant two spirit inclusion facilitator. Uh, since 2018 alone, over 1,500 staff have been trained in transgender variant two-spirit inclusion. Uh, that number goes up another 800 to 1,000 if we go back to 2016. Um, other things that have happened is um, our, we have an employee and family assistance program and there you can, where staff can access counseling in, in a confidential and safe way and that our provider identifies counselors and clinicians that have specific experience with uh, trans uh, and gender uh, gender diverse uh, experience. Uh, what else do we have on that? Uh, the Templeton, okay, the, I love this. Board of Parks and Recreation, once a week at Templeton Pool, has a trans inclusive swim where they create uh, a fully, um, the, the entire center, the swimming pool within the center, the sauna, the steam room, uh, is dedicated to uh, transgender diverse people and their friends and family. So once a week they have a safe space to go where they can use public change rooms, public washrooms, and public swimming pools uh, in, and, and take advantage of something that we take for granted, just being able to exercise in public spaces. Um, and so that's a really amazing thing. We're currently reviewing all of our forms and, and the spaces where we ask for voluntary gender equity information, so when you apply for a job, they ask you to voluntarily disclose your gender or uh, when public uh, engagement does a survey and they want to get a demographic sense of who's answering the survey, we're reviewing how we ask those questions so that we're not talking about gender assigned, or we're not talking about sex assigned at birth, we're talking about do you identify as male or female, we're, we're changing our language. Even our email signature blocks, um, the city has updated its style guide to say, you know, state what your pronouns are at the bottom of your email signature. So just little things like that that are creating a culture of inclusion um, are all arising out of this strategy. Um, the third wise practice, and uh, that's been, this has been highlighted a lot this week, is the women's equity strategy. And uh, thank you, Ellen, for, <laughs> for being the, the pioneer with this. In 2016, City Council directed staff to um, update the 2005 strategy and review it with a goal of uh, com you know, complying with practices and current needs and uh, the Women's Advisory Committee was such a key stakeholder and, and, and uh, in terms of providing input it was um, a great experience to work on this. This was one of my first projects as a city staff was to help coordinate this. Um, so five priority themes were identified and, and they've already been touched on here as well on this panel. Um, the first priority theme is, is more of a process. It's the application of an intersectional lens to the city's work. So not just to the five priority themes or to the women's equity strategy, but the intersectional framework that is being developed as part of this strategy is to apply to all of the city. Um, and uh, the city senior leadership in November are going to get training in gender-based analysis plus come November, that's already scheduled for their, their senior leadership team meeting. And it, it's something that will apply to our resilience strategy strategies as well. The other four priority themes are more substantive, um, child care um, and, and the ability for, for women to participate economically being hindered by child care. Vancouver has the third largest 
gender employment gap in Canada. Um, and it's, there's a correlation between high gender employment gaps and the cost of childcare. Um, housing, the housing crisis in Vancouver has particularly hard hit women because women are overrepresented in part-time jobs and minimum wage jobs. And the, the, the gender um, uh, division in our workforce, uh, women, the work that is overrepresented, where women are overrepresented tend to make less, tend to earn less. So for all of these reasons, unaffordable housing hits women harder. Um, so dealing with that. And then leadership and representation is who we are as an employer and how are we doing in terms of uh, encouraging women to, uh, in, 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 in leadership or in trades or operations or firefighting or IT. So we're, the city is a large employer and can make, uh, and should, take, should take leadership and should be an example um, in that area. So those are the five priority themes. Within those five priority themes, we identified 18 short-term actions. So the, the strategy is a 10-year strategy, and we developed actions only for the first two years because we're learning and we, we don't know what we don't know. And so for the first two years, we, we, we identified some actions that we, could, that we could sink our teeth into, and that would also help us to know ourselves better moving into the next couple of years. There was also a lot of changes happening with a new provincial government, a new federal government. We didn't want to tie ourselves into 10 years of actions if a whole bunch of new opportunities were going to emerge as, as they have uh, with childcare, with housing. So uh, for that reason, we identified 18 short-term actions and that May 29th update to council that's at vancouver.ca forward slash women's equity um, has detailed updates on all of those 18 actions um, and we're on, on track to get them all done by the end of 2019. I just want to, I'm gonna highlight a few key um, Key, a few key accomplishments. So one of the first things that we did is we joined the UN Women's Global Flagship Initiative, UN, cities, UN Safe Cities and Safe Public Spaces. And this uh, connects us to cities around the world who are concerned about safe cities and safe public spaces. And I wanted to um, just talk about the scope of our safety uh, priority. The city and the Vancouver Police Department are, are two separate organizations. And in the, so the BPD is independent of the city. So when we talk about safety in the context of this strategy, we're talking about safety in public spaces um, and not uh, access to justice for women who have been, who've experienced gender-based violence. So we did join UN Safe Cities and Safe Public Spaces and uh, that commits the city to conducting a scoping study on women's safety and that's scheduled to happen in the fall. Um, and it's a, a scoping study is a very participatory Form of research to look at women's experience of safety and actually walking through a neighborhood uh, and finding out where women uh, experience uh, a lack of sense of safety. Another thing that we did last um, last fall was we collaborated with community partners on a campaign to raise awareness of gender-based violence. And what you see there is a poster that we had up, uh, one of several posters that we had up on uh, bus shelters across the city. Uh, we recognize the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence that take place between November 25th and December 10th every year. November 25th being the International Day for the Elimination of All Forms of, no, the Elimination of Violence Against Women, um, and December 10th being International Human Rights Day. And in between, on December 6th, we recognize the National Day of Remembrance um, following the Montreal Massacre. So during that 16 days, we had, uh, we used the city's social media presence to amplify what other organizations were doing. There's already tons of amazing work and, and education that's happening during that 16 days from community organizations. And we didn't want to step into that space. We wanted to amplify that space. So that's what we did. We also have over 6,000 employees in the city. So we conducted an internal campaign as well on 16 ways and 16 days that you can take action on gender-based violence. So we used our internal communications channels to uh, reach out. It also provided an opportunity to work with, uh, to provide education to our managers on how to recognize if somebody is experiencing intimate partner violence, how to create safety in the workplace for them. Uh, it, you know, if, if that, if the impacts of that violence is, are spilling over into the workplace. So it was a great opportunity and it's something that we've committed to, to doing every year through the Women's Equity Strategy. Um, we also have goals around employment, so we've consistently achieved the goal of 50% of female new hires in leadership roles. Uh, we've trained recruitment staff on unconscious bias. We've increased outreach and recruitment for women.
women in underrepresented roles, including having an, an employment info session. The poster is there um, specifically for women in trades and operations. The Department of Engineering, under Cheryl's uh, leadership, has uh, developed its own diversity and inclusion action plan specific to its department, and Vancouver Fire and Rescue Services has um, created a new position, an assistant chief for recruiting, outreach, diversity, and inclusion. So there's a lot of things happening, and and as I mentioned, a lot of other things that weren't in the strategy, but that are kind of uh, being influenced by the senior leadership team getting quarterly updates on this and, and having this front in mind at every one of their quarterly meetings. So it is influencing other parts of the city, uh, the city's work. Um, oh, and other, key, other key accomplishments uh, exceeded the target of 1,000 new child care spaces by 2018, which was also a goal in the city's healthy city strategy. And negotiations are underway with the province on capital funding, uh, on a capital funding agreement for child care. So um, the city's really trying to, it doesn't provide child care, but it creates public spaces that can be used for child care. It provides building development permits uh, where they, you know, they can uh, ask for um, uh, levies that can be used towards community amenities like child care. So the city's using its levers as much as possible to try and stimulate the, 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 the development of child care uh, in the city. Um, we have some related initiatives that have been happening in parallel. We're cooperating, or no, cooperating, partnering with Women Transforming Cities on, on a three-year research partnership, and we're really happy with that work. It's, it's provided us with some great information. Um, we're also participating in Project Rise, which is the, which is yeah, the, which is what you were, yeah, yeah, so she was, uh, you, you were talking about the, um, you know, the, the different phases, and so Project Rise is the employment phase, and the city's part, the city's participated in that. Uh, and we also participated in, in McKinsey's annual survey. So if you're familiar with McKinsey, they do this Power of Parity International Survey. The city participates in that survey and gets a, a, a tailored report just for the city. So it provides us with great information to inform phase two and the next uh, iterations of the women's equity strategy. Um, and this, <laughs> I have to bring up this motion again. Um, this is the motion. When we, when we provided council with the updates uh, to these two strategies last week, this is this is the motion that was passed. So we have our work cut out for us, and um, and looking forward to the work. It's very exciting. And it will definitely build on uh, what we've already started with the women's equity strategy. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the, the amazing and tireless efforts of Ellen Woodsworth and Women Transforming City in making this happen. This is huge. Um, and uh, and I just have to say that that your 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 advocacy is such an inspiration because you're 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 at what's positive and collaborative and inclusive while at the same time being uncompromising and, and relentless and tireless and that's such a powerful combination and it's wielded these amazing results so thank you very much for that um, I think that's all I wanted to say thank you very much. seriously than it does on men in Bangladesh when there was the flooding, 180,000 people died, 90% of them were women. Or in uh, Japan when they set up the recycling strategy, worked with Greenpeace, the, the housewives said, we're not doing They said, we're not doing any more unpaid work. So there's all kinds of ways you can look at different uh, bits and pieces that belong to cities as responsibilities that uh, we need to work on with them with that gender intersectional lens. So I'd like to <coughs> open it up um, for questions to the speakers, and perhaps the speakers may have some questions for each other. Um, the first one from the audience. Any thoughts, questions, examples? Do we have a spare mic? <coughs> yes. I can speak loudly. OK, maybe you should just stand up. Hi, this question is uh, sort of for you, Therese. 
Um, I was very impressed when you were talking about the kind of support. It seems that all these initiatives have, have built up internally in the city. So you talked about a lot of wonderful things you're doing externally, but also within your organizations, even down to email signatures and those kind of things. I come from a career much the same as, as you have seen. So I'm a geological engineer in training. I work primarily in construction. I'm regularly the only woman in the room. But when I'm back in the office, I'm working on International Women's Day activities and trying to do the like diversity and, and inclusion initiatives. Like I'm very involved in that. And so sometimes I see really great progress and I see people, I, I, I see them changing their minds or changing their habits and it's really promising. But a lot of times you also run up against people that are not interested or don't see the point and you know usually not anyone who's quite so malicious but just in general like don't bother me with this kind of stuff so how have you found what kind of challenges have you had or seen encountered in the city and you've obviously mentioned a few of the really positive changes that have happened but what do you do when you encounter some of those challenges even internally when you're trying to make a difference externally i think the city has benefited from one of the best practices with equity, diversity, and inclusion, and that is having senior leadership that is championing it. So it's uh, it's being championed at the highest levels in the city, not just with council, but at, at the highest levels of city leadership. So uh, that has really been helpful. Where we've come, you know, where we've had some pushbacks, what we do with every with everything that we implement, we've got a, one of the short terms action, actions is a breastfeeding policy for, for the workplace for, for parents who return from uh, parental leave. And uh, for everything that we implement, we have a, a parallel communication strategy. And we think in advance, what are, what are gonna be the pushbacks and how can we frame the messages? How can we share, tell the story to, um, to address that potential uh, pushback? Um, and a lot of it is really about relationship building and about, uh, and about storytelling. I think that that's, those are two things that really drive it home. Yeah, we haven't had a huge amount of pushbacks, but those those things have helped. Could I add to that? Because I know what you're talking about exactly. <laughs> we have to celebrate the same things with cakes and things. <laughs> um, and I think two things come to mind. One is what they say about meeting people where they are and trying to just use language or just more gently, you know, that's part of it. Kind of ongoing, 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 and then maybe there's some shifting. And then sometimes finding opportunities um, to create amazing outcomes and people don't even know what happened. So recently, one of um, the women that reports to me, she came back from that leave, and right before she was due to come back, an opportunity came up to go to site in southern Chile in the middle of nowhere, because um, there were World War I bridges, and there's all this cool stuff that she's specialized in. And so we talked, and next, next thing I know, she's taking her baby, before she comes back to Madrid, it was a week before, and she's off to Chile, and there was all these accommodations, and a colleague, and she stayed with a colleague, and they arranged daycare, and it all happened. And then um, my manager said, well, isn't she supposed to be back? Like, what happened to Anna Marie? And I said, well, you know, she's doing this, and he's looking at me, kind of aghast, and I said, well, yeah, I mean, just her second baby, it's no big deal. <laughs> so it was like, um, really, it kind of ordinary, but you have to kind of look for ways to kind of, you know, look for those things, yeah. If I could just maybe add, um, sort of returning to the idea that our, our policies and our laws are our soft infrastructure, often when you have that sort of formal reporting obligation, it, what it, the benefit is that you move these issues out of political culture, and if I am in agreement with it, I'll do it, but if I'm not individually in agreement, I don't really need to worry about it, and if you actually democratize it in ways that you have a policy that's saying you need to measure and you need to report out on this and this is now a KPI that we're accountable for. In some ways, individual preference and individual opinion is not your job. Your job is to implement the work and the policy. So I think that's the one nice way of sort of tackling how do we change norms and culture through our sort of policies that get us to think about these things as just they're public goods that we need to deliver on and we're accountable, and there has to be public transparency. So individual opinion is not for And you need the disaggregated data to do that. You really do. Yeah, you hold it. That was the biggest thing that came forward at the UN Habitat at the Women's Assembly, about 200 local women's organizations. 
but then to decide to get a data, people just say, oh, that's just your opinion. Yeah. And we, we know that it's true, but if we don't have the data, we can't collect the data, and we've been limited by some federal legislation that's having to shift so that we can get that data. Okay, send it back. Yeah. I, um, started there, there were something like 26 VPs, only one of them was a woman and she was a junior VP at that. And then there was a change in government and there was a change in <coughs> CEO, which is typical when there's a change in government. And it went down to about nine VPs, three of whom were women. And I was a 37 year old longtime feminist and I found this thought going through my head as I saw these women, wow, I could be a VP. Meaning, I had thought I couldn't be a VP. And I was shocked that I had thought that. 
I have no ambitions to be a DP, <laughs> but it's just the notion that I'm that influenced unconsciously. So I, I think with electoral reform, where I'm going with this is, is representation that reflects the makeup of the population. Diversity, that includes gender, uh, and we're 51% of the population, women identified women. Um, so that would be the, electoral reform can look like many different things. I, there's many, you can't always pick the system you have, so what you want is to, to make sure that that system is picked, including diversity. That it, it's, it's not just an electoral system, how do you elect people, it's how do you deal with language, multiple languages, gender, diversity, et cetera. That's all I can think of off the top of my head. Do you want to add, add something else? Well, I, I think it's really, you know, we are all very conscious that the council is all feminist, the, <coughs> the two men and, and the eight women, but it is uh, almost entirely a white council. There's one person who's not self-identified white, not white, and there was one uh, lesbian. And so it really does not represent the Vancouver of today at all. And so we really need to think about that, the gender and the intersectionality in terms of going forward. And there was discussion about council, about a campaign, uh, electoral reform uh, discussion, but also a campaign to engage more people in the electoral process, because this is one off. We've had two councils where there were 50% women on council, and this is really a highly, highly unusual, and it's often determined by the back of the boys in each party. And if you look at where Canada, I think Canada's number 39th in the world in terms of the electoral representation of women, let alone having the gendered lens or looking at indigenous leadership, or in Vancouver looking at leadership from uh, who um, have an Asian background, which would be more natural in a city like Vancouver. So there's lots of discussion that needs to be had at City Hall and how to ensure that on an ongoing way the uh, councillors do But she's done all kinds of work with uh, uh, on some of these issues, so I wanted to draw that out. Other people, thoughts, ideas, information that they know of, of examples of women from the cities? Or ways in which they think cities could be more women friendly? Jeff, you were wanting to say something? Um, well, if I could address just your point here and the idea of how do we get such diverse populations and yet generate councils that actually don't reflect that. And yes, electoral systems. The campaign did reflect that. The election, no, the elected people don't represent that. So, so the actual outcomes in many ways. And there's a, I mean, before doing a disaster resilience, the last 20 years really of my work has been mostly on, on thinking through electoral systems and how do we create laws and regulations that help us diversify our candidates. And until we change the recruitment processes of forcing at the electoral period times that we have to have a diversification of all the candidates and substantially diversified across all of the political parties um, so that the pool will actually then reflect the full diversity across those spectrums. And we don't, we start, we, we approach elections as though it's a fair playing field when it's clearly not, and the systemic discriminations we're discussing and why intersectionality matter, they also affect the biases that affect electoral recruitment and who gets, who gets encouraged to act, to run, who is supported to run. Um, so thinking through not only our electoral systems, but what will change party behavior and the internal culture of political parties to be inclusive, to go beyond their standard networks of who they know and have, have relationships with of professional bonding and trust how do you diversify those spaces to whom they will go and say, hey, why don't you run? But if you don't have trust there already across a diverse group of spectrum, you don't ask those people to run and back them. And you have also, I think, it would, the, the reason I favor some kind of award PR system is that in those systems you can include women's unpaid work and volunteer work in the community on your resume, which is normally not included in your resume. Usually it's the people who are professionals who are and get elected and there's no reference to that other aspect of our lives and for women it's particularly important. I just want to plug something that the city is doing again I think this might be thanks to Alan's advocacy there's a uh, as part of the women deliver project
projects or legacy projects, the city is hosting a, a Women for Politics a mock council for young women between the ages of 18 and 23. So uh, applications are now open for that. It's going to happen in the fall. The, women, the, the young women that are selected um, for the mock council will have a one-on-one -on -one mentorship with the city here at the city council for one-on-one -on -one mentorship and then we'll have the, the opportunity to experience what it's like to serve on council um, and it'll it kind of demystify the process and hopefully uh, encourage uh, interest in running for office and um, hopefully this is a success it might be something that happens annually or ongoingly but um, do look at look for it on the city Vancouver website uh, within four politics with a four and that was the best That's great. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh, the ongoing yearly uh, look. Um, sorry. So daughters, daughters, daughters was convening uh, young women from across Canada from each federal constituency riding to come to the House of Commons and represent their riding in the House of Commons and do basically a mock parliament yes. and really speak to what would be the, the needs of their riding. It's an annual. Um, and they're also Equal Voice is partnered with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities doing a look at systemic barriers to women's participation in local um, government and that we, Vancouver Women Transforming Cities is partnered with the City of Vancouver doing the same kind of things. So um, it's all, the, the inequities are getting exposed and we're beginning to come up with the solutions. One of the, if there are no more questions, or is there any questions between the speakers of other things, I don't wonder if Joy had any other comments about uh, the online library of wise practices and um, kinds of things. Just that we're we're open for submissions, and so if uh, you know if you in your communities or, or you know of, of other wise practices out there, we're we're happy to uh, have you post them on our. Well, we have, there's a there's a process to do that, but. Site and there's a submission form. Um, I think, you know, just, just I want to thank the speakers. It's been a wonderful discussion, and I, I'm, I'm starting to change my mind about whether Vancouver or Seoul are, you know, getting closer <laughs> in, the, in the challenge part. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's I, I don't need to say anything else. Yeah, as we say, cities that work for women work for everyone, and there's an urgency, as we all know, about climate change and electoral reform that we really need to address by putting that gender lens on. And I'd really like to thank Cheryl Nelms for all of the work you've done over the past week. You must be exhausted. And one more one more panel to go tomorrow night. And I know that uh, Council has uh, taken on a huge initiative. Thank goodness it's unanimous. it was a unanimous decision. Now they just need to fund the staff and get the framework in place to do that. And I'd like to thank all of the Everyone keeps sharing their wise practices with us so that uh, people around the world get a sense of the kinds of things that are possible that we can learn from people around the world that are miles ahead of us. Thank you so much for coming this evening. It's been a great